Transmitter device activated. Coordinates set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome to the Earth 2 podcast, the podcast where we explore the origins and development of the DC multiverse and the legacy of Golden Age characters throughout the Silver and Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter Watson. And I'm David Steele. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us today. We're looking at a story from issue 57 of Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane, which was published on the same day as Showcase 56, which we did in the last episode. And that was the 25th of March 1965, and Lois 57 has a cover date of May 1965. This is quite a short Lois Lane story that we're going to be looking at today, so um, stay tuned for afterwards because we're going to be doing a bit of a recap on a lot of the stuff that we've covered so far on the podcast. Yes. Now, Peter. Yes. We are not doing what we normally do, are we? We are not going to do what we normally do with this story. Uh, And you'll find out why as we go along because this is very problematic, very controversial. Some elements of this story haven't aged well. And they weren't good at the time either. Yeah. So... We've, I mean, we did a Lois Lane story before, didn't mm-hmm. we? The Girl Who Mourned for Superman. And we talked a little bit then about how the way she was written and sort of portrayed as being a bit of a drip. Yeah, because this is a comic mostly written by middle-aged guys who yeah. don't really and write good comics for girls. We speculated it. Were the audience, were the people that were reading it, were it was it girls? Was it or mm-hmm. And questioning the, f- the thought that some of this stuff was being peddled to girls, essentially. And, and to be honest, this issue is a lot worse, isn't it? I was seriously considering dropping this issue from the rotation. Yeah, but I've, for sake of completion, we're uh-huh. doing it. I've had to persuade Peter to give this as much in depth as, as we're actually going to do coverage on it. I mean, I mean I, we decided to do every story, every parallel Earth story. Yes. Because you know, at first we were just going to do all the, the Earth 2 superhero stories, and then we thought, no, let's try and be as thorough as we can. Mm-hmm. So it's in the spirit of being as thorough as we can. But we're not going to do a full read through, we're going to do a partial read through, and then we're going to talk about and summarise some of the story, of it, and then yes. we'll, we'll wind it up by, by reading through. Let's talk about the cover, yes. first of all. This is a good, yes. you'll see exactly. That we're talking about here. So it's the customary mid silver age sort of white background and features Lois Lane and Lana Lang. There's some nice pictures of Superman on the wall. Yes. It's a cut shaven burger cover, I should say. Yes. It's beautiful. It has that lovely sort of fresh Archie comics quality yes. to it. Very which, cartoony. Which he had, which he took with him when he was drawing Shazam. Yes. For a while in the 70s. Mm-hmm. You know, some, some of those comics are an absolute pleasure to read. They really are. Mm-hmm. On the cover, Lana is standing with a broken hairbrush mm-hmm. and a tennis racket where the, the handle of the tennis racket is broken and the various strings and the frame of the racket are broken and Lois is sat down and she has super baby over her knee and Lois has a very pained expression on her face and there are little waves of pain radiating from Lois's left hand she has she's basically been scalping super baby on the bum mm-hmm. super baby of course being that um that retconned idea that Clark was active as an infant in a blue and red outfit <laughs> yes I'm a big I think I quite like super baby stories they have a certain <laughs> charm true yeah. they're quite funny I'm going to put a contemporary super baby gallery on the socials so Super Baby's over Lois' lane and he's thinking to himself, may not feel anything yet. When Lois start to spank me? And Lois is saying, You brat, this will fix you for the heartbreak you'll cause me when you grow up to be Superman. Ow, my hand. Ah, uh, yep. And Lana is saying, Relax, Lois. You know an experiment turns Superman into a super tart for a week. See what happened when I spanked him? And this takes us back to the hairbrush and the tennis racket. So... Corporal punishment, is that the word? It's a word. A <laughs> phrase. A phrase, I should say. Yeah. So yeah, this is a cover which is advocating corporal punishment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm one of these people that's from West Central Scotland who um, <laughs> kind of grew up being quite used to that sort of thing. Didn't do me any harm, <laughs> so to speak, that's... is the parroted phrase, which isn't the case at all. I mean, let's talk about it. Lois is punishing the child for something that the child will do as an adult. Uh-huh. This is just the start of the problem. Yeah, I mean, it's, it <laughs> says so much about just the way Lois is written and that horrible relationship dynamic yeah. that they had at the point. Uh-huh. I mean, I mean it's, it's not... I mean, we've already... Entitled isn't the right word, but she's got this certain feeling of entitlement that, you know, she should be with Superman yeah. and no one else uh, and nothing should stop that. Yeah. Especially in these sort of stories, mm-hmm. um, that definitely mm-hmm. is clear. The thing we should mention again, we've already said this a couple of points recently. At this point, the emotional sophistication of the DC comic stories is awful compared to what Marvel had been doing yes, basically definitely. since they started. Definitely. Yeah. We can talk about Peter Parker's angst and all that sort of stuff and the family dynamics between the members of the X-Men or the Fantastic Four. Mm-hmm. Where you know compared to this, you know, but even when you compare this to other DC stories published at the time, mm-hmm. this is way behind. Yeah. Is, I mean, Mort Weisinger the editor of this story, uh, mm-hmm. and most of the super books at the time. But see if you compare this to the ones that Julie Schwartz was doing, and like oh, Flash yeah, it's and, years, isn't it? and uh, Justice League. I mean, 
It's yeah. totally different. Compare this to Green Lantern 32, which we yeah. were you know, uh-huh. about a month or so ago. That was really nice. It's quite mature for its time as well. I mean, so there's, and even that Green Lantern one for the DC stuff at the time was light years ahead. Mm-hmm. I mean, basically, there's a, a lack of sophistication. Yeah. I remember when I was a, a sort of proper neophyte, hardcore DC collector, uh-huh. and picking up the old Silver Age Lois Lane issue, or the old Jimmy Olsen, and my sister and I would fall about laughing at Lois being transformed into a witch or blah, blah, blah. But when you dig a bit deeper... There's some really poisonous attitudes. Yeah. This story especially has them in spades and demonstrates them. So, And we're not going to whitewash it completely. We're going to talk about them. Anyway, so who wrote this story, Peter? This was written by Leo Dorfman and John, it's either Fort or Forte, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, how you pronounce it? F-O-R-T-E. It was the artist on it. Right. So yeah. Not names that I'm overly familiar with, I can't lie. No, Leo Dorfman, he did quite a lot of work for Mort Weisinger. Uh, mostly right. Superman family books. I don't want to say nothing really of notes, but nothing really that I think is hugely memorable for okay. people. So on the cover then, smug little child getting his bum scalped by, by a lady who has severe emotional issues and then Lana looking quite foxy, it must be said, with her broken instruments because she's already had to go at the child with them. Right, so there we go. Think of that where you will. So we start off with a two-thirds of the page splash panel, Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane, and a cap- an opening caption which says, In her campaign to marry Superman, Lois has tried every trick in the book to no avail. All poor Lois has ever asked is just one break. Now, suddenly, that big break comes. Through a weird accident, Superman becomes a super baby. And, as his guardian, Lois can now influence his tender little heart with thoughts of love that may make her Missy Superman someday. Yes, Lois has an unbeatable plan when she becomes... Lois Lois Lane, Lane, Super Super Baby Sitter. Influence his tender little heart with thoughts of love. Hmm. There's something seriously wrong with Silver Age Lois at this point, isn't there? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, opening panel. Super Baby is writing on a blackboard with chalk. He's writing, me love Lois, me love Lois, me love Lois. And Lois is saying... Write the words again, Super Baby, darling. And she's thinking... A faulty experiment turned Superman into a baby temporarily. What a break. I've hypnotised the tot with a spinning mirror. Now I'm giving him post-hypnotic <laughs> oh, suggestions no. to make him propose to me when he becomes an adult Superman. <laughs> yeah, again. the... um. The spinning mirror is what look is that what looks like the thing the desktop fans yeah. of that little unit there. So and Lana Lang is standing in the doorway. And she's thinking the schemer. Just wait until it's my turn to babysit with Super Baby. And then the story starts properly. As Superman flies Lois Lane and Lana Lang to an assignment. And Superman flies into panel, carrying Lois and Lana on top of a pile of luggage, dropping them in front of what looks like a big fancy hotel. And Lois says. Thanks for dropping us off, Superman. The Swank Hotel gave us a suite for the weekend, so we could publicise its grand opening. Glad to help. Oh, I'm taking Clark to my fortress to ride up my experimental youth restoring machine. As Superman leaves... And Lois and Lana are on the balcony of the hotel room. Superman is flying off and Lois says... Superman, what about the Daily Planet anniversary party on April 19th? You promised to attend. Don't worry, Lois. My youth restoring experiments are scheduled to end by then. I'll be there on time. And he flies off. On to page two, with Superman flying off in the distance, and Lois thinks... Ah, what a gorgeous hunk of a man. I can't wait until I see him again. You can you can hear Peter's enthusiasm for this, can't you? <laughs> I've basically twisted his arm to do these pages. Rest of watch. And Lana's thinking... My dream boat! He's not even out of sight and I miss him already. Well, Lana, you hussy. Caption says... Relax, girls, he'll be back soon, but in a way you'll never forget. Slow dissolve, the captions for the next panel says... That evening, as Lois returns to the hotel... And we see Lois in a trademark red pillbox hat. The hotel's in the background. And basically, she's spotted Super Baby, who's in the alleyway next to the hotel. Looks like he's beating up an oil drum or something. With some boom, boom, boom sound effect captions. And Super Baby says... Ha ha! Baby make big noise with drum! And Lois thinks... Good grief. That infant, he's dressed in a super costume and his tiny fists are denting that metal barrel as though it were tinfoil. This is one of Peter's most um, naturalistic performances. It I feel. is. It is. It's quite laid back by your recent standards, mm. matey. <laughs> so the next caption says... An instant later... And Super Baby's a bit too tough because the drum is collapsing on him and he says... Blah! Me break drum! And Lois says... Ye gods, where did that tyke get the strength to mash that barrel? Wait, I have it. It's Superman. His youth experiment must have gone wrong and turned him into a babe. He instinctively flew back to the hotel to find me. So this Lois' first encounter with Super Baby. Ah, could be. Mm. Yeah. So Lois bends down, starts mopping the tiny tot's tears away, and Super Baby says, (laughs) Me lost! Please take me home, pretty lady! And Lois says, Of course I will, you super darling. Call me Auntie Lois. Right, and Lois thinks... The poor thing doesn't remember me, but I'll have to care for him until the baby effect wears off. 
Hmm, this could be a ball. Oh dear. Right, so Super Baby flies up into the air, bearing Lois behind him. Lois thinks, The hotel management might ask embarrassing questions if I take him through the lobby. So, and Lois says, Super Baby, fly Auntie Lois straight up in the air. I'll tell you where to stop. And they take off, and Super Baby looks like a little monkey, doesn't he? That's actually He says, Okay, wee! This be fun! Instants later... And they've arrived at the balcony. Lana's standing on it, and Lana says, Lois, what on earth? Who is that super tot? And Lois, <laughs> I quite like the panel of Lois and Super Baby floating in, and Lois says, I'll explain later, Lana, <laughs> just as soon as I can get him to come in for a landing. And she thinks, I forgot that as a baby, he'd not yet mastered his flying powers. So we move to the top of page three, and the caption says, After the Super Babe lands, Lois explains. And they're now inside the hotel room, with Baby Clark standing on the table, and Lois is saying, so, this accidental super infant effect is probably scheduled to wear off by April 19th, when Superman promised to attend the planet anniversary party. Till then, it's up to me to be his babysitter. And Lana says, You mean it's up to us, darling. And this is where we're going to pause on the read-through. Yeah. In the next panel, Lana is cuddling Super Baby, and she's saying, Chevy loves to cuddle in my arms, if only he would act this way and become Superman again. And this has... Lois thinking, she's attracting Super Baby's attention with the LL space jewel necklace Superman once gave her. Hmm, but she just gave me an idea. Lois is putting on an overcoat and she says, Oh, Lana, I have to visit my apartment. <laughs> Would you keep an eye on Super Baby for a little while? I'll be glad to, Lois, dear. We'll play hide and go seek. And Clark leaps up towards the chandelier saying, Wee! Me hide up here! So Lois has returned back to the hotel room and she's pinning up pictures of her and Superman that she's obviously collected from her own apartment. Yeah, and she admits in the thought bubble to using psychology to influence Super Baby by basically conditioning him into associating her and him together. Yes. She shows the pictures to Super Baby, the photographs, Mm -hmm. and then Super Baby takes the pictures down and tears them up because he prefers Superman just wants to keep them. And Lois is quite upset at this. And we're at the cover in the next panel, the top of page four, and this is um, Lois has been spanking Super Baby, and he's not felt a thing, etc. And then Lana comes back in. And we discover that Lana tried the same thing. She brought in pictures of her and Superman as well, and he torn them up as well. Yep, and this one we see the broken tennis racket and the broken handbrush. Mm-hmm. So then Lana decides to sit down and watch television with Super Baby. Yep. It's a fun activity for them to do. And Lois gets a bit twitchy about this because Super Baby will associate sitting with Lana as being affectionate and stuff. Yeah, okay. And the television programme that they're watching features a guy called Professor Mills who is about to demonstrate the use of post-hypnotic suggestion. And he says that children are the most easily influenced when under hypnotism. Can you see why I have problems with this story? (laughs) Yes, Professor Mills says, A month ago, whilst this lad was hypnotised, I gave him certain commands. Let me replay the tapes of that programme. And we see the Professor in the rerun hypnotising uh, the boy that's with him and... Conditions him into pouring a pitcher of water over himself, basically. Yes. Now, and the Professor laughs and says it's exactly what he ordered him to do a month ago. And of course, Lois being Silver Age Lois, she decides that she's going to use the post-hypnotic suggestion idea on Super Baby. I do like the art on that panel with the raised eyebrow. Yeah. It's very and, very scheming, very sensitive, yeah. almost Romulan in its look. Uh-huh. And Lana twigs that she's up to something. Lois then contacts the hotel management and requests a blackboard, an electronic fan, a small round mirror, and a baby crib. And this is basically the setup that she was using in the splash panel where she's trying to hypnotise baby Clark with the spinning mirror on the fan. So she sets up the blackboard, brings in Super Baby. With the light on the fan spinning, she gets him to write Me Love Lois on the blackboard. Lana sticks her head around the door frame and realises that she's doing this. So then Lana contacts the hotel manager and asks for a toy top, a can of red paint and a gallon, a gallon of ice cream. Oh my God. Some, some room service they've got yeah, in this hotel, I'll be that, honest. That reminds me of um, the episode of Red Dwarf when the cat is try- he's on the dream recorder. No, I forgot that. And he's trying to find his dream from last month. <laughs> me, three girls and a family sized tub of banana yogurt. <laughs> this isn't the one. Anyway, so the hotel manager looking quite harassed at this point, mopping the sweat on his brow. Well, it's interesting. He says, yes, Miss Lane, as opposed to yes, Miss Lang. Okay. Oh. Um, and okay. he says, these reporters are really putting us through the ringer. Later on, we see Lana and Super Baby, and she has the spinning top. And Lana thinks about how she has painted a spiral design to try and put the baby into a hypnotic state. And this time, Lois overhears this. Basically, Lana... Peter's leaving this to me. (laughs) Lana is is hypnotising baby Clark into putting a ring on her engagement finger and telling her that he loves her. 
Mm-hmm. Lois is eavesdropping and she, Lois is thinking, she's using my scheme to condition him with post-hypnotic suggestions. When he becomes Superman, he'll tell her he loves her and want to put an engagement ring on her finger. And Lana is basically using the ice cream to condition Super Baby into doing this, really, isn't she? Yes. And she says, as soon as you finish that plate of ice cream, we'll play with the top again, darling. And Super Baby saying, yummy. And Lois is thinking, using ice cream to win his poor defenseless little heart. How crooked can you get? But I'll top her. We then have a slow dissolve to the hotel kitchen and Lois is addressing the poor manager and some of the kitchen staff. There's a, I love the jowls on that guy carrying the cake. Yes. And we'll put that panel up. Absolutely, yes. And Lois is basically asking him to deliver 50 cupcakes topped with marshmallows and cherries to their suite. And the, the manager says he'll deliver them within an hour. So, back in the hotel room, and the spinning fan with the, the mirror on it is still going, and Clark is still being influenced by it. This is pretty rank. For what well, actually is a better way, this is really dodgy and really inappropriate. Yes, even by it. 1965 standards. Basically because she's feeding Clark the cupcakes, but in order to get a cupcake, Clark, or Super Baby, has to kiss Lois. On the cheek. Yes. On the cheek. I'm just saying what Lois says in this panel. You'll have all the cupcakes you want. But you have to kiss Auntie Lois for each one you get, dear. We move to the top of page seven. This is only a a nine-page story. You'd be glad to know. It's not a full-length 26-page Murphy Anderson-drawn epic. I don't think it would have drawn it. Our man, Dr. Fate, Lois and Lana on the Psycho Pirate. Actually, that that would read. read, Yeah, yeah. anyway. And there's, there's this panel of baby Superman kissing Lois. And she says, just remember, darling, after you become Superman again, you're to kiss me like this whenever you see me. And then it's back to Lana. Super Baby says, we play with Top again, Auntie Lana. And Lana explains, helpfully to us and to Baby Clark, that she's using the spinning top again to plant another, as Lana puts it, the most important post-hypnotic suggestion. And she basically says, forget Lois's command, Super Baby. Remember, you love only me. Next Thursday as Superman, you'll attend the Daily Planet party at 8pm. That's when you'll propose and put a ring on my finger. I feel really sorry for Super Baby. Super Baby pipes up with yes, Auntie Lana. So um, they're using the post-hypnotic suggestion to try and implant the idea that he loves Lois and then that he's mm-hmm. going to propose to Lana and he's going to kiss. This is quite... It's horrendous. Yeah, I mean, it's... So, um, let's finish yeah, the story okay. first. Then right. We'll go back to everything. Okay. So, moving on with page seven. And Super Baby is tucked up in bed and Lois is there. She's got the spinning fan with the mirror on it. Oh my! And Superboy looks absolutely pained. He, he looks shattered because Lois is trying again and she's saying, remember dear, when you're Superman again and attend the planet party next Thursday, you will ask me to marry you promptly at 8pm. And little Super Baby is saying, me do it, Auntie Lois. So they've both hypnotised them mm-hmm. into proposing to them at 8pm at the Daily Planet party yes. on April the 19th. We'll have to make a note of that in our respective calendars <laughs> for April 19th next year. So, we're basically going to move back into into reading from this point. The next panel is probably the standout panel for me in the entire <laughs> comic. It is phenomenal. Uh, page 7, panel 5. Early next day. And it's the hotel room where they've been keeping baby Superman in the crib. And there's a super baby shaped hole in the wall. It's phenomenal. It's it terrific. Absolutely. It's, it's Looney Tunes at his best. Yes. It's incredible. And Lana says, super baby, he's gone. And Lois says, He must have started to become adult again. He probably began to recover his memory and flew out the hard way. The weekend over, the girls begin packing. And sure enough, Lois is packing up her clothes and she's imagining a vision of her in a wedding dress and Superman flying it off. And she's thinking, Poor Lana, she'll be broken hearted when I become Mrs. Superman. Actually, see that image. Yeah. It's very much like the actual marriage of the Earth to Superman to yeah, Lois. It looks very much like... 484, which is way the in the future. Yes. Listeners, we'll uh, get there eventually. Stay tuned for that. It's, yep. a much, it's a much more entertaining story. And Lana also is packing beside her, and she's thinking, Poor Lois, she'll flip when Superman proposes to me before the whole planet staff. And Lana is picturing, in her mind's eye, Superman down one knee, taking her hands in his, and obviously popping the question. So we move on to page eight. The following Thursday at the planet anniversary party. Things are in full swing. We can see Perry White and Jimmy Olsen hobnobbing and having schmoozing and having some drinks and Lois is wearing a dress which is a black top and a long flowing white skirt and she's wearing white gloves. Lana is wearing a green top and a long flowing black skirt. Very attractive. Lois looks very Audrey hepburn yeah. yeah. And Superman flies in the open window. Yes. And Lois is thinking Superman, he's his old self again and he looks so eager I guess he can't resist the subconscious impulse to propose to me. And Lana is thinking Superman, how thrilling to see him as an adult again. I can't wait till we announce our engagement. But as the big moment arrives... 
and we see Lois and Lana looking up at a nice big fancy clock on a pedestal which is showing 8 o'clock. In the background Superman is chatting to Jimmy and Perry and Lana is thinking, it's 8 o'clock but Superman is practically ignoring me and Lois is thinking, Superman should be proposing this very minute but he acts as if he doesn't even see me. I must speak to him. Soon as Lois corners Superman in an isolated cloakroom. And that's just weird. I can mm. imagine him, I imagine him sort of walking up and grabbing him by the hand saying, Right, you, you're coming with me. Yes. So they're in the darkened room. We can see some hats and coats hanging up. And Lois is poking Superman in the chest and she's saying, Superman, what happened? It's after eight o'clock. I ordered you to obey my commands. And Superman says, Huh? What commands? And then Lana enters the picture and says, Don't listen to her, Superman. You were to propose to me at eight o'clock. I gave you post-hypnotic commands when you were a super baby last week. And Superman says... It's all news to me, girls. And Lois says... There's been some slip-up. Maybe I'd better explain. As Lois tells the weird story... And Superman reacts by saying... But girls, my youth-restoring machine short-circuited and blew up before I could even try it. I never became a super baby. A likely story, says Lois. Then who is the super baby we took care of for the whole weekend? And Lois and Lana look really vexed in that panel. It's quite good. So in the next panel, they're flying out the window of wherever the, the party was taking place. It's probably at the hotel, actually. But it looks mm, like mm-hmm. it, doesn't it? Yeah. And Superman has wrapped Lois and Lana up in his cape. And he's saying, that's a good question. Come on, girls. I've got a new device in my Fortress of Solitude that will help us solve the puzzle of that mysterious super baby. And at the top of page nine, the caption says, Soon at Superman's Arctic headquarters. And we see Superman busy at some equipment and there's some ta- spinning tape spools and yeah, flashing lights and, and little um, little radiation dials and stuff on the wall. It's quite like the inside of Peter Cushing's TARDIS. It's a bit. And Superman is busy at the machinery and he's saying, I'll record the facts on this typewriter. My new visual computer will analyse the details and show the probable origin of the strange super baby on that screen. As the computer goes into action... And a voice comes from the computer saying, The mystery super baby came from a parallel world, one of countless such worlds, all similar to this earth, but each with its own peculiar differences. The babe was the superman of his earth until a youth restoring device he was experimenting with exploded. And on the screen of the computer, we see that happening, we see the machine exploding and Superman shrinking down to basically being baby-sized. We see silhouettes of Lois and Lana and Lois says, He's turning into an infant and vanishing. And the next image we see on the computer screen in the next panel is Lois kneeling down and mopping up the tears of baby Super Baby in the alley where he was breaking up the drum that we saw at the start of the story. And the computer voice continues, The explosion turned him into an infant and hurled him through that dimensional barrier into your world. Instinctively, he sought out people who resembled his friends. Lois thinks, so that's why he came to the hotel. Ah, interesting. And in the next panel, the computer voice continues. But later, an automatic safety switch on the youth machine reversed the entire process, changing the tot to Superman again and returning him to his own world. And we see on the screen Superman kneeling down in front of Lois and Lana, who are dressed actually in the same way they are. Yes. On the earth. Yep. Mm-hmm. he's kneeling down in front of Lois Lana's standing there as well and he's taking Lois's hands in his and it looks like he's proposing and indeed our Lois says my post-hypnotic suggestion worked he's proposing to my double and then we move to the panel 5 of page 9 and the caption says but the next moment and then we see on the computer screen Superman it looks like he's putting a ring onto Lana's finger and our Lana says now he's proposing to my double and your Lois double is smiling I don't get it Then the computer gives the answer. And we see an image on the computer screen of Superman with Lana on his right arm, Lois on his left arm. They're both wearing wedding dresses. And the computer says, Since bigamy is legal in the parallel world, this Superman will marry both girls. And then Superman says, So you see, girls, all that scheming and cunning was for nothing. (laughs) Ha 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 ha! And Lois and Lana look a bit... Still, they look fine with it, to be honest. And we have a tiny little caption which says... The, the end. end. So there we go. It was Super Baby from a parallel universe, or a parallel Earth. Yeah. Well, well right. it, was a, it was a DH Superman. Yes. Yeah, it's not so much Super Baby. But yes, that was horrendously problematic. You know... Uh, Two adult grown women... Trying to brainwash a child into loving them. Yeah. Uh, getting them kisses, kisses. and treats... 
Yep. Hypnotising them. Scalping yeah. them so that they break household equipment. Like, uh-huh. Why do they have a tennis racket? The room service them? in this hotel is amazing. Yeah. That's, that's all I can say. Obviously, you know, they can do anything. This is... They're going to get a glowing report in this uh, in this grand opening because the room service is astounding. That yes, is, and that's, that's, that's the one takeaway yeah, that, that I get is also, this hotel would be a good, very accommodating staff in this hotel. And they need to get a plasterer in to fix that super boy shaped hole in the wall very quickly. Even by the standards of 1965, that is a story that should yeah. not have been published. It's very, um, you can see how someone might think it was cutesy and funny, but looking at it from with modern eyes, it's like, Hang on a minute. I think even from the eyes at the time, if you're... Because this is written, obviously, for, for kids and also for... Mostly, possibly written more for young girls. Mm-hmm. And it's just... It's yeah, I mean, that's message. it. It's the, it's the message it's sending its audience. Yes. That you can condition a guy into loving you by get, giving him cakes or by hypnosis mm-hmm. or by playing with a spinning top. You know, it's... There is an undoubted innocence to a lot of the DC Silver Age stories at this point still. Mm-hmm. Maybe even naivety... I think it genuinely, it was not written with the intent to sort of furnish adults with <laughs> how to, <laughs> I don't even want to say it, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, so we shan't. Yeah. We shan't. It's, um... Listener, you can infer what we're talking about yeah, quite easily. It's, um... Uh, it's, it hasn't it hasn't aged well, and it's interesting, I mean, we don't have any reader, rea- reader reaction. No, we there couldn't find any letters pages that yeah. actually covered this story. They can see ones for the issue before and ones for the issue after, but there's nothing for this one yeah, that I could find. That we've been able to find. So we're not sure even what people thought of it at the time. I mean, there's a couple of other stories in the comic. When we did The Girl Who Won for Superman, we mentioned the monster from another dimension. That mm-hmm. The second part of that story is in this issue originally. It's typical Lois and Lana fighting over Clark. Yeah, and, but, the most but in a really way. <laughs> yeah, in a really horrible let's condition him and interfere with his psychological development. Mm-hmm. So basically, this Superman from the parallel Earth uh-huh. has come to our Earth, mm-hmm. been regressed by accident. Yes, yeah, while he's regressed as a baby, they have corrupted him for want of a better way of putting it, and he's gone back to this parallel universe and and married and been yeah. conditioned into marrying the other mm-hmm. Lois and Lana. And our Superman has a right laugh about it. Yeah. But, you know, he's, his parallel universe version has been compromised. Mm-hmm. I mean, the other week we talked about the uh, brainwashing machine. That, That's uh, right, world's finest. That Lex Luthor used on the evil Superman and... So the good Lex Luthor used on the evil Superman and Batman. Yeah. Uh, and the connotations that had. But uh, this is a step beyond. Also, it's, it's good to remember that um, right about this time there were adverts and stuff in the comics for... Hypnotise your friends, that sort That's of right, thing. Yeah. You know, all the, yeah. the all the joke shop and trick shop things. Uh-huh. Less so in, in these issues just now, but it's it's more I think it's more bronze age actually. They did it for a while. But yeah. Then, Same sort of stuff yeah. as the X ray glasses and yeah, uh-huh. look taller and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, joy buzzer, all and, that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, the the muscle adverts that probably start coming in soon after this. Yeah. If you're reading this story you would rattle through it in a matter of minutes. It's yeah. it's large panels. Only half a dozen to each page. It's only yeah. nine pages. It wouldn't take you long. It's, it's the exact opposite of a Murphy Anderson, Gardner Fox, it certainly Our is. Man and Doctor Fate epic. It certainly is. We haven't even touched on bigamy yet. There's yes. Sense yeah, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a brilliant twist punchline. Oh, and since bigamy exists, since I mean, I'm delighted the fact I got to play a computer talking about bigamy in of a course. parallel universe. This it's, is, it's a lifelong dream. This is precisely why we started doing this podcast. They're treating that as a comedy punchline. Yeah. And Superman laughing at them. Yeah. Laughing at them. It's, because they it's, failed. It's, it paints a very toxic depiction of, mm. of relationships and, mm. and there's, a, there's a weird psychology to it and it makes me wonder about the mindset of a lot of the super, Superman editorial team at this point in history. Yes. The only good thing I can take away from this story, I'll be honest, is the super baby shaped hole in the wall. That was phenomenal. <laughs> yes. That is absolutely phenomenal. I love that. That's and it's great. and it's one more parallel earth story. It's one it is more indeed. parallel universe story, yeah. which um, you know, I would have loved to have had a panel in Crisis and Infinite Earths when well, spot I can't really say actually, because we haven't got that far when when the Superman and his two wives, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh dear! I've got my head in my hands. Let, so. You know, let's um, let's not go there. The implications are enormous. Anyway, so that has been Lois Lane Fifty Seven, the Super Babysitter. Do let us know what you thought, readers. If yes, you know, via the various social medias and all that. So this is our twenty eighth episode. Wow, time bad. flies. Time not bad flies. at all. Uh-huh. <laughs> High five. <laughs> I salute your, I salute yeah. our, our respective commitment, our tenacity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we thought we'd do a recap for you of the various Earths we've been to, and some of the creative teams behind them, and how different the stories have been in taste and flavour. Mm-hmm. So right back at the beginning, the first 
travel between dimensions we came across was in Wonder Woman 59 from March 1953, Wonder Woman's Invisible Twin. Yep. Uh, that was written by Robert Kaniger uh, with art from Harry G. Peter. And that was actually the Earth 2 Wonder Woman who travelled between dimensions there. So she was the very first person to yep. traverse. She was the Golden Age Wonder Woman at that point, wasn't yes, she? Yes, uh, we hadn't the original had Wonder Woman. Yeah, yeah, we hadn't had the, the Earth 2 term. No, that's true. Yeah, forget everything, all the, the hot think pieces that you see telling you it was it was the Flash that was the first person to travel. No, it wasn't. Definitely not. And of course, that first travel was caused by a lightning strike. Yep. And she ended up in a duplicate called Terra Tarunas Earth. Mm-hmm. And yeah, again, she came back via another lightning strike. Yep. Interestingly, she lost her lasso uh, going over there, but she came back with Terra Tarunas lasso. So that's never been referred to again. Yep. So there you go, fact fans. Roy Thomas was slipping. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, next, moving on to Superman's Greatest Feats from Superman 146. That's May 1961. Mm-hmm. Written by Jerry Siegel with some art from Al Plastino. Mort Weisinger was the editor of that one, uh, who was also the editor of this one. And it's the Silver Age Superman, the Earth One Superman. And basically, it's a time travel glitch as he's travelling through time. He kind of like slips sideways in time and yep. manages to save Atlantis, President Lincoln. He saves Krypton from blowing up, yep. etc. <clears throat> and basically, he comes back via the same kind of time travel glitch. So, yeah, yeah. that's another Earth that we come across. Mm-hmm. And then after that, it's the mother of all stories, isn't it? It's Flash of Two Worlds from Flash 1, 2, 3. Yep, when the multiverse is cemented, yep. pretty much there. And mm. Barry Allen's attempt to, to do the Indian rope trick ends up in him vibrating through to a parallel universe. And yep. It's where he meets the Shade and Jay Garrick and the Fiddler and who was the other guy? I can't remember. Uh, Thinker. Thinker. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and of course this was uh, the first Gardner Fox and certainly not the last Governor Fox multiverse story, with uh, great art in it from Carmen Fatino, and also, obviously also the first one under Julie Schwartz's editorial mm-hmm. purview. So yeah, that was Barry, Flash, coming from Earth 1 to Earth 2, and coming back from Earth 2 to Earth 1, by vibrating both times. Yep. Then we've on to the second Flash team up from Flash 129, Double Danger on Earth. Again, same creative team, Gardner Fox, Carmen Fatino, Julie Schwartz, and it's the Earth 2 Flash, Jay Garrick, who comes to Earth 1, Again, through vibrating, copying what he saw Barry do. Are we going to talk about our first visit to Earth Prime in the pages of Strange Adventures? Tell us. Because Earth Prime hasn't been named as such yet. It will be fairly, well not fairly soon, in a couple of years worth of um, stories. We did those Strange Adventures. Set in the real world, so to speak, which is later referred to as Earth Prime. Um, Yeah, so we have that story which is basically set in a real world where Julian Gardner and Sid Green obviously pops up, and that's um, it's a while before we cement Earth Prime as a distinct Earth, but we covered it because it's it's the first sort of instance that we knew about where you yeah. know, people from the real world. So that's worth pointing out. No interdimensional travel within that one, but significant no, but for just... being a, a story using people from yeah. the real world, as it were. Uh-huh. The next story we have is technically not a multiverse story, because it's a different kind of parallel Earth. It's from JLA 15, it's The Challenge oh, of the Untouchable Aliens. Love that story. Your favourites. <laughs> My second least favourite now. <laughs> again, written by Gardner Fox, art by Mike Sikowski, Julie Schwartz again, editing here. And this was Stone Giants, yeah. who appeared from a parallel Earth that exists in the same plane as Earth 1, but it's one minute in the future. Yes. So that, was that a vibrational? It was a cobalt bomb. That, right. That's what uh, caused the, the Stone Giants to want to come through. And basically, it's Green Lantern's power that's ring. That's what I was going to say. Green that Lantern's power ring. To, that the heroes used to yeah. travel there and back. Yeah, so that's the first time we see Green Lantern using his power ring, which is an amazing power when you think about it. Uh-huh. You know, that he can use his ring to travel between mm-hmm. universes, And if he can do it, then surely every other Green Lantern can yeah. do that as well. Interesting. That's worth bearing in mind. Oh, yeah, it's worth bearing in mind for when Peter and I write our own DC comic where we do a pre-crisis story where Abin Sir travels to Earth 2 and has an adventure with the Golden Age Green Lantern. Can you imagine? Or something. I can imagine. Just imagine. I just did. Hey. There you go. So the next multiverse travel we have is in Flash 137, Vengeance of the Immortal Villain. Oh, of course, yes. Uh, again, Gardner Fox, Cameron Infantino, Julie Schwartz, that dream team. And it is the Flash of Earth 1, vibrating through to Earth 2 once again. And of course, what Sim- does this bring us yep, back? Very significant because it's the proper return of the Justice Society. Yes. And it's probably safe to say that going forward, they're going to be the, the focus of the bulk of the stories that we'll be talking about. Yeah, absolutely. For want of a better way to put it, the kind of casual parallel universes... Mm-hmm. kind of falls away after a while the throwaway parallel yeah. universes there's still a few that will pop up occasionally yeah a couple of stories I'm really looking forward to is doing but you know going forward the return of the Just Society mm-hmm. almost full time it's the one that caught the, the public yeah. imagination really yeah it's the, it's, the, um, it's the one that they run with so yeah and that was followed up by the first 
JLA GSA team up, Crisis in Earth 1 and Earth 2, right. Governor Fox, Mike Sikowski again, Julie Schwartz editing. And this was the Crime Champions, the Wizard, the Fiddler, the Icicle of Earth 2, and Kronos, Felix Faust, and Dr. Alchemy of Earth 1. And it was the Fiddler who discovered vibrations that uh, could travel through the parallel Earth. Mm-hmm. And also it's the Fiddler who names the Earths. Yeah. And he names his own Earth, Earth 2. Yeah. And the other Earth, Earth 1. Nice one, Isaac. I mean, that, that's another one that I think um, people just sort of generally sort of hold that Flash 1, 2, 3, it all kind of falls in Earth 1. You'll be the Flash of Earth 1, that'll be the Flash of Earth 2. Yeah. But it's not, it's, this you know, is it's, a, little, the, it's yeah. a good couple of years later and it's, um, and it's as you say, it's it's a baddie in the, mm-hmm. in the middle of a JLA story. Yep. And also, as well as them travelling through vibrations, we have also got the use of Merlin's Crystal Ball by the Justice League for their interdimensional travel there, mm-hmm. and also the rings of both the Green Lanterns as well were used. Of course, of course. And also this uh, gives us this limbo dimension in between the two Earths, where the Crime Champions have their swinging 60s hideout pad. That's right. Which is cool. And that was where the Fiddler kept his, his wig. His, his glorious flowing on, white locks. On that little, um, on little it, dummy head. Yeah, Tremendous. That was fun. Very similar to what I do myself, actually, listeners. Of course. And that brings us on to Lois Lane 43, June 1963, The Girl Who Mourned for Superman. That's a much better Lois Lane story, written by Leo Dorfman, the same guy who wrote the one we read today. Yes. With great art in it from Kurt Schaffenberger. Much less contentious, mm-hmm. and that's that's another lightning strike, isn't it? It is, and it's Lois, who gets hit by lightning. Yeah. She ends up on a parallel earth, where Superman is killed, and she comes back by spilling water on an electric typewriter. Electricity. Yes, again. Again. It's interesting. Let's, let's keep a tally of this. Okay. Right. Yep. Uh, next up we have World's Finest, 136. That's July 1963. The Batman Nobody Remembered from writer Bill Finger, artist Jim Mooney, and edited by Jack Schiff. This is the Batman of Earth One, whose bat plane is struck by lightning. Again, electricity. Yeah. And yeah. ends up in a parallel world where Superman is Bruce Wayne. He comes back by the Superman of that world, uh, recreating the storm that the bat plane was initially in, and that brings him back by again being struck by lightning. Mm-hmm. Moving on to Action Comics 308, November 1963, Superman meets the Goliath Hercules. I cannot find a writer credit for this anywhere. Oh, right, okay. So, Interesting. unfortunately, because we quite enjoyed that story. The art was Al Plastino, though. Uh, Mark Weisinger was the editor. And again, it's Superman. And again, it's a lightning strike. And yeah, this is the world with kind of like amalgam characters, like uh, Ben Hur's in it. Of course. Hercules is Goliath sort of thing uh, it's all that really confusing red kryptonite yeah mm-hmm. fun fun story but you know yeah. it's uh, a bit weird but uh, again we don't return there so that's fine even though it said we would that brings us on to the second JLA GSA team up and that's from Justice League of America 29 and 30 from June 1964 Crisis on Earth 3 the most mm-hmm. dangerous earth of all written by Gardner Fox art by Mike Sikowski editor Julie Schwartz this introduces the Crime Syndicate of America and indeed Earth 3, the Earth that has the evil duplicates. The parallel universe transfer is done in this via Power Rings. Power Ring. So, yeah, that's how they uh, manage to travel after Ultraman sees through the dimensions with his Ultra Vision. Mm-hmm. And the Crime Syndicate go from Earth 3 to Earth 1 and indeed from Earth 3 to Earth 2 in this story. But the GSA travel back via Doctor Fate's magic haven't had that yet right and the Justice League of America get back to their own earth via Green Lantern's power ring interesting so yeah again other ways to travel between the parallel mm. earths I look forward to seeing how these various methods continue mm-hmm because the Green Lantern power ring ability isn't something that springs to mind very often is it no it'll be I mean, interesting to see you know when we get to some of the later JLA, JSA sort of team up stories mm-hmm. if that ever comes into effect or if it's ever used there's quite a few like Silver Age stories where he uses it to travel through time mm-hmm. but not very much as far as in other dimensions go however the very next one is Green Lantern 32 Green Lantern's Wedding Day again written by Gardner Fox great art in it from Gil Kane again edited by Julie Schwartz and this is Hal Jordan, the Earth One Green Lantern, who's exposed to yellow espion radiation, which sends him off to a parallel world where his counterpart and his girlfriend in Earth One, Carol Ferris, get married. And uh, basically, they returns by the radiation wearing off. That's right. And yeah. then both Green Lanterns create a barrier between their worlds to stop that from happening again. Mm-hmm. That we should probably mention. That's one of the stories that Jonathan Last gave us a heads up about, isn't it? Yes, uh, so thanks so, very so much, Jonathan. Yes. Huge thanks, Jonathan, for making us aware of that one because it was a story I hadn't, I hadn't read before. And I was really struck by how, compared to some of the other stories we've done, mm-hmm. and I think I said this earlier on actually, compared to the Lois Lane one that we did today, you know, the attitudes to sort of the adult relationships, it was, it was yeah. worlds apart, wasn't it? Absolutely, yes. Mm. 
The next one that we covered, although chronologically not technically the next one, are a couple of Superboy stories. Uh, we have Superboy 116 from August 64. That's The Ordeal of Chief Parker. Jerry Siegel writing. Al Placino again on art. Mort Weisinger again, the editor. And that's a Superboy from Parallel World who comes to Earth 1 via Red Kryptonite and a nuclear explosion. And not, not a nice combination there. Interesting. Uh, and basically, at the end of that story, he goes back because the effect wore off and he vanished back to his own world. So now it's not really clear whether it's the effect of the red that wore off or whether the effect of the nuclear explosion wore off. But basically, it wore off and he just disappeared and went back <laughs> home. Uh, then the very next issue, Superboy 117, October 64, we had Superboy and the Five Legion Traitors, written by Jerry Siegel, art by Kurt Swan and edited by Mort Weisinger. And it's the Earth-1 Superboy who is caught up in a star that goes Nova. And ends up in a parallel earth where Small Vile is the town where he lives, and there are five Legion traitors. Yeah, the Legion is baddies. I think we talked about the time how that was just a complete wasted opportunity, really. There was never a massive parallel universe Legion story. Yeah. Did we talk about Legion of Three Worlds when we did that story? Uh, we touched on that a bit. Did yeah. We? yeah, cool. And he gets home by flying through the dimensional maze, this thing that uh, doesn't really uh, come up before now, but he seems to know about it. It's almost like the Captain Marvel Rock of Eternity Interesting. Uh, kind of way. But yes, the dimensional maze, it just casually... So and a, the ideal story that. is that someone reduces his power ring to override the effects of being struck by electricity, but then he gets caught in a nuclear explosion but uses the dimensional maze to get home or something. Whilst vibrating. Yeah. Uh, so we have that. That also In that episode we also covered the very casual mention of parallel earth transport with Chameleon Boy and Prote going to a parallel world, but we aren't told at all yeah. how that happened. You know, by so, the 30th century, it's commonplace, isn't you, it? You it's catching think, a bus. Yeah. You would think, but this hardly turns up in the <laughs> Legion stories. That brings us on to Action Comics 320, November 1964, The Three Super Enemies. Also Binder, the writer, Al Plastino, is the main artist in this, although Kurt Swan did the splash page. Mort Weisinger is the editor again on this one. And that's Superman reaching back into history for help, isn't it? Yes, that's where he gets uh, Atlas, Samson and Hercules. Mm -hmm. uh, But they turn out to be evil versions from Parallel Earth. Now, it is possible that could be from Earth 3. We don't know. We We speculated about that. Yeah, we we talked about that at the time. So we don't really know. We can't say for sure, so we can't really count it as an Earth 3 story. Mm -hmm. But that's Superman's time travel device that he, he constructs. It's affected by the inhibitor wave that the uh, bad guys are using at the time to go on their crime spree. And that's why it uh, goes to Apollo Earth, as Mm -hmm. opposed to the heroes that he knew from the past. Mm -hmm. And they return by going back through the portal that he created. Uh, So that's what happened there. Next up is Flash 151, January 1965, Invader from the Dark Dimension. Again, it's the classic Flash team there of Gardner Fox, Cameron Infantino and Julie Schwartz. It's the Shade this time. The Shade who travels from Earth 2 to Earth 1 via the Dark Dimension. Because he saw yeah. he saw Jay vibrate from Earth 2 to Earth 1. Now, we've only seen that happen in one story, so we can only assume that that is this when Shade was hiding in the bushes watching him. Yeah. Uh, unless it happened in an untold story we haven't seen. Mm-hmm. So obviously the Shades witnessed the Flash vibrating, recorded the vibrations, and then followed him through via his own Dark Dimension he had access to. And that enabled him to go forward and back between Earth 2 and Earth 1 via the Dark Dimension. So that's another way... You can travel between parallel Earths. <laughs> uh, getting there, getting there. World's Finest 148 was next. Superman and Batman Outlaws. Written by Edmund Hamilton. With art by Kurt Swan. Again edited by Mort Weisinger. This is the Earth-1 Superman and Batman. It's an unknown device created by a scientist. The Apparatus. The Apparatus. To give it its title. Yeah. Yes. Which we can only assume was designed purely for dimensional travel. That's how they travel from their Earth to the Earth where they are villains. Which is not Earth-3. Yeah. So yeah, and they get back home the same way. And then that brings us up to today's story, where we have the malfunctioning youth restoring device, which had an automatic fuel safe in it, <laughs> uh, so that when it wears off, you'd automatically go back to the parallel world that you originally came from, even though that wasn't its design. Mm, sure. So yes, that's a brief recap of all the all the Earths we've so been to. The thing that's really apparent at this point is that there's no set down, defined, singular way of travelling. No. There's loads. Yeah, absolutely. The electricity thing is there a couple of times. The oh. vibration thing is there a couple of times. There's Green, magic. There's power rings. And rings, etc. There's access via another dimension. Yeah. There's all sorts of stuff. It's really interesting. So that's what it's over a dozen Earths anyway. If you include Earth 1 and assume Earth 1 is the starting point in all cases. Sure. And if you include 
Earth Prime, which mm-hmm. we haven't met properly in the narrative yet, but we are counting it okay. as Fair Strange in place because yeah. we know that coming forward Earth Prime is going to be a thing. Sure. And if you include the JLA 15's Earth with the Stone Giants as being a separate defined Earth, uh-huh. basically in total, we're looking at no less than 16 Earths. So far. Yeah. It can only go up. Can, um, you can't take them away. And obviously, we've been, to, we've been to Earth 2 seven or eight times at least. Mm including you with the showcase stories, which are the only ones we've had so far that have been completely set set, on Earth 2. Mm -hmm. The next episode, we'll be back on Earth 2. Mm -hmm. There's a Justice League one coming up where we see a different Earth, but it's not really a parallel Earth. You'll have to tune in and find out. So that's been a quick recap of our journeys and also uh, the story we had in Lois Lane. Yeah, the super babysitter. If you've been affected by any of the issues in that Lois Lane story, (laughs) please feel free to email us. Uh, you can get us at theearth2podcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash theearth2podcast where we'll be posting up some images, some very, very carefully chosen yes. images yes. Uh, from this issue. And also we've got lots of bonus material on there as well. Follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore earth2 and on Instagram we're at theearth2podcast as well. Please do check out the various social media pages because we're putting an awful lot of supplementary material. Just give you a bit more context about the characters and the stories and everything that's going on. Shout out to Steve Higgins. Thank you, Steve, for giving us some feedback after the World's Finest episode. Yes, had a good chat with him on, yep. on the Facebook page. That was um, fun. So Steve had some ideas and some thoughts on some of the questions we asked whilst we were reading the story. So we appreciate that, Steve Matey. Yeah, and if you've any thoughts at all about the Lowest Lane story we've covered today and any of the other stories we've done, you know, do get in touch because we'd, it'd be nice to nice to kind of hear what everyone else is thinking of it so far. Absolutely. Well, that kind of wraps up this week. I've been Peter. And I've been David. And you've been listening to The, the Earth, Earth 2 Podcast. Podcast. Transmatter Cube activated. Return coordinates set for Earth Prime. Good grief, the rumbles. Mm-hmm. The gods don't want us to do it, David. They don't want us to do it. <laughs>